And as you are seated, I invite you to take your red hymnals there in front of you, and I invite you to find Psalm 51. They're before the hymns and after the order of service. And um, locate Psalm 51, because we're going to talk about this. This is a Psalm of David. And some of those words are familiar to you, but we're going to put it in context today with what King David was writing about. I wonder how many of you have ever traveled by plane. Raise your hand if you've traveled by plane. Oh, good. So then you'll know, you'll go with me on this first analogy. Think for a moment, what is the scariest thing about flying? Perhaps it's not the fact that you're thousands of feet in the air. Perhaps it's not the fact of uh, if you're going to get there on time. I would assert that one of the most scary things of all is letting go of your luggage. In fear of it getting lost. It's every traveler's nightmare, isn't it? When you have so carefully packed every single thing you need for the trip, and then you have to give it to a total stranger and hope you see it again when you arrive at your destination. Many of us have been there, haven't we? We endure a cramped flight, a painfully slow process of deplaning, and shuffling down the aisle of the aircraft, and snake our way through concourses and down escalators to the luggage area, only to discover that ours, for whatever reason, is nowhere to be found on the luggage carousel. Great, you think, just my luck. And so begins the painful process of trying to track down and reclaim one's personal baggage. The airline industry, however, is quickly quick to tell us that the plight of lost luggage is really very, very small in the grand scheme of things, very rare. 99.5% of checked bags are successfully picked up by their owners. And of that half of 1% that go missing, 95% of those bags make it home within five days. Not bad, considering the millions and millions of bags carried across the country and around the world every day. An interesting comparison can be made between the literal baggage that we carry on in our, through our own packing and fret over while flying, and then that metaphorical baggage of sin, burdens, and brokenness that we carry as we crisscross through our lives each and every day. Both the literal bags and the figurative bags are largely with us through our own packing, our own choosing, both are heavy and burdensome. They come with rolls, don't they, and handles and knives. They make it easy for us to take our baggage on long walks, long trips. Both are things that we tend to hold on to, afraid of how we are going to make sense of life without the essentials that are in those bags. One bag, one suitcase, might contain your favorite shirt or your favorite outfit, a key to your confidence so that you want to make sure you look good to others on the outside because inside it's so very dark. The other bag is filled to the brim perhaps with the abuse that you've suffered or injustices that you've endured or some secret shame, all of which though unhelpful, are comfortable and familiar because you've carried them for so long. They're critical to how you see yourself. Which brings us to King David, who we can all relate to. King David has a suitcase full of sin. And he just brings it to God, unzips it, and opens it, and out comes his sin to God. 
You can picture it as you hear David's passionate words. Let's look at verse 1 through 3. David says, Have mercy on me, O God. According to your steadfast love, in your great compassion, blot out my offenses. Wash me through and through from my wickedness and cleanse me from my sin. For I know my offenses and my sin is ever before me. Against you only have I sinned and done what is evil in your sight. So you are justified when you speak and write in your judgment. So David is saying basically this, here it is, Lord. I'm a sinner. I have done something ugly. And I need you to free me of this burden. David, David's sin was one that he had relations with Bathsheba, a woman that he lusted after. However, there was one problem. She was married to another man. He was with Bathsheba, and then she became pregnant. So David ordered her husband, Uriah, to be killed. He murdered Uriah. He arranged for the murder. And he now is coming to the Lord, desperate for relief from the crushing weight of what he's done. David knows that if he's left to bear this on his own, he will surely perish. That brokenness he couldn't handle any longer. He's desperate for a place to drop that baggage. He's begging for cleanliness. And here we are in the season of Lent, in our brokenness and our sinfulness, this time of confession and repentance that comes up over and over as we gather to worship Wednesdays, Sundays, Wednesdays, Sundays, as we journey with Jesus to the cross. This is a time for us to take inventory of our brokenness, the baggage, the sin with its weight, the scars and the shame, the issues and the idolatry slung over the shoulders. You can just see all of your arms and under your arm and over your shoulders just full of that baggage. It's a season where we, as weary travelers, are invited to drop our bags at the foot of the cross. But I want to be very clear. The next thing is, probably the hardest thing, the goal is not to pick them up again. Unlike at the airport, where we let things go only for a four-hour flight as followers of Jesus to take whatever messed up stuff that we've been carrying and leave it behind. Like, really, don't pick it up again. Unclaimed, unmarked, ready to be snatched up by Jesus. You see, our luggage is just longing to be lost. Some bags are longing to be left behind. And Lent is about this God's invitation to ditch such things at the foot of the cross, to find God's mercy and grace and trust, trust in him that he will relieve us of that burden. We know that in Jesus, the fact is that he was lifted up on the cross. He was killed in public view. And in the process, he paid a price so high, so high that it covers the cost of every sin-stuffed suitcase that we could lay at the front of that cross. Jesus gave his own life in exchange for every single piece of baggage that's been breaking our backs. On the cross, Christ has become the rightful owner of our sin and our shame, bought with his blood, which means we are now free to leave it behind to the one person that will own it, claim it, 
carry it and not be completely crushed by it. I know you're probably thinking, but I don't know. I've got some stuff. It's dark. It's evil. It's downright disgusting. These bags that I'm carrying. And because of that, maybe you're assuming that it's too much for Jesus to take on. Or maybe impossible for you to ever completely leave it behind. But not so fast. Look at David's words again to God. David knew about God, having committed some most unforgivable acts. David unflinchingly offers his sin-stained self to God. Let's read in verse 7. Well, I'll keep reading um, verse 5. Indeed, I was born steeped in wickedness, a sinner from my mother's womb. Indeed, you delight in truth deep within me and would have me know wisdom deep within. Remove my sins with hyssop, and I shall be clean. Wash me, and I shall be purer than snow. Let me hear joy and gladness. Do you see where David knows there's joy and gladness on the other side of this? He wants to leave it once and for all. Let me hear joy and gladness that the body you have broken may rejoice. Hide your face from my sin and blot out all my wickedness. And then these words, which you are probably familiar with from traditional liturgy. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a right spirit within me. Cast me not away from your presence, and take not your Holy Spirit from me. Restore to me the joy of your salvation, and sustain me with your bountiful spirit. Think about it. Don't you think the God of the universe can handle what you have hidden and have been holding on to? It's not as if you're going to surprise him, really. He already knows every burden you bear, every sin that you're struggling with. The issue here is not whether God can handle what you're carrying. That's already been decided and settled. The issue is whether you will trust him, whether you'll take these things to him and leave them with him. That's what this season of Lent is a reminder of. It's the invitation I set before you today to take inventory of all that you're carrying, to reflect upon it at your lunch break at work or in the time between hauling your kids from hockey to dance or when you bow your head before you go to sleep or when you wake up. But especially as you come forward today, as you walk underneath that cross to leave your baggage with God, to open those, the contents of the cases that you carry, and to say to yourself, I will not lug this anymore. I will lose it. I will abandon it. I will give it to someone who can handle it. I will drop it at the feet of my crucified Lord. Try it. And then feel free to repeat as necessary. Jesus is accepting baggage all year round not just in the season of Lent, or not just today. And once you experience that joy and that freedom, as David says he was looking forward to experience, you will walk through life with a little less weight on your shoulder, perhaps a lot less weight off your shoulders. Be sure then to spread the word. There's a world around you that would love to know of a place where one sins and struggles can be deliberately laid down, deliberately given. Take a cue from David in these verses that follow. He says in verse 13, Let me teach your ways to offenders and sinners. Sinners shall be restored to you. Rescue me from bloodshed, O God of my salvation, and my tongue shall sing of your righteousness. He's saying, I'm going to tell people, I need to tell people, that this is what they can do, that this is what's available. There's freedom on the other side of our baggage. 
This season, I invite you to leave some stuff with Jesus, to take it to the cross. He's already paid for it. You can leave it there. No name on the tag, no questions asked. And he promises that you will never see it again. Amen.